Custer's Alive, book number three, The Curse of Green Force Magic, segment part number two, audio, script version, written by Gregory Wright, G. The Writer. Chapter two, what comes around, goes around. When Jacob had woken up the next morning, he felt really strange, strange as if no one had known him. The thought of him being forgotten made him feel like he was doing something wrong. And it had made him feel like he didn't belong. The fact that he had still lived with his parents made him feel weak inside. And it had made him feel as if he were not of age. But the thing is, he knew that he was of age. That he was 26 years old. And that he didn't need to be watched. And it was almost as if his night's worth of sleep had woken him up to see the bigger picture. To see what his life was made up of. That there would be no more second chances if he gave up. The thought of being forgotten had made him feel more open and appreciative for what he had in his life. And it had given him a sense of wisdom, a sense of courage. Everything that he had ever wanted, all wrapped up in one bundle. But at least it was his life that he had to take control over, nothing else. When Jacob had gotten up and out of bed, which was at 9.30 o'clock, he had noticed the strange object that he and Boomer had found the day before was missing. But how could it be missing? He wondered to himself. How could it be that it has vanished from my pocket? Those two questions had made him feel scared, just as what they would for anyone who always tries to be cautious of his or her surroundings. Though at least for him, for all he knew, someone might have stolen it from him, someone who might have wanted revenge on him from the very beginning. But who could it have been? That was another thing that he had wondered, as he had slipped on a nice pair of dark blue faded jeans, which had been worn out to its finest level use and quality. After Jacob had done that, he had slipped on a nice shirt and a pair of socks to keep his bare feet warm. Then after he had slipped on his socks, he had headed off downstairs to check on his mom and dad. Luckily for him, When he had nearly reached the last three steps, Mom had called him in for breakfast. For him, that was a huge relief, and he had taken away most, if not all of the feelings that he had, came enacted with since the moment he first woke up. Get a plate to eat. Don't be shy, Mom demanded, as her will and concern for Jacob had released love in many new and unknown ways ways in which their love for each other had departed, forming a more perfect and more relentless connection between the two of them. When Jacob had finally got down the stairs, he had heard a knock at the front door. I got it, Dad said, as he had quickly worked his way across the room on a search to try to see who it was. Just when he had tried to do that, he opened up the door with extreme caution. Well, come on in, guys. You were just on time for breakfast. It's a good breakfast. Eggs, hash browns, pancakes, eggs. My body hasn't been able to handle eggs lately. I don't know what it is. It's been driving me nuts for the last two months. I can do hash browns, though. I think they are better on my stomach. It was Kate that had said that. As... She had walked up behind Billy, Bruno, and Josh, who had barged their way into the house. Such a nice house you guys have. Have you guys done some improvements, remodeling since the last time you were here? Bruno asked while looking over at Jacob, who had already been eating his pancakes. While Jacob had taken care of that question, Dad had snuck up behind Kate to close the door. Jacob had finished chewing the last bite of his pancakes as Bruno had stood in the midst of him, analyzing his every move and thought. No, we didn't. We haven't for quite some time. 
We've just been hanging out, I'd say. Bruno interrupted. Well, I thought about shooting some hoops later on. Just me and you over at Creekford Park. Would you want to come? Jacob gave a sigh at Bruno, and then he had thought about the night before and where the object might have gone to. But if it was anything like Creekford Park and taking his mind off of the things that had bothered him the most, chances are he would say yes. It was mostly because Bruno was the one that he was talking to. If it would have been anyone else, it would have been a complete no for him. That was because Bruno was his buddy, and he had always been there for him, even in his worst moments, which he had almost on a daily basis. But lately, it had been happening way too often, which had been a typical characteristic for a person of his age. But at least it was normal, and that's one good thing you could give him. Hold on, sweetie. Let me fix you up a plate. I'll get you a paper one, well, so that you can take it on the go. How would that sound? It was quiet for a moment as Dad had walked over to the couch, sat on it, and turned the radio on for a little bit of noise and amusement. While he was doing that, Mom had started fixing up Kate's plate, even though Kate hadn't really even said a word to her. I take that as an I'm not sure about it yet moment, Mom had said with little to no effort as she had flipped a few pancakes and a hash browns on Kate's plate, all while topping it off with a few scoops of homemade butter and sugar-free pancake syrup. Thank you. I really do mean that. It was Kate who had blurted that out of her mouth as she had walked over to Jacob's mom to go and get her plate of pancakes and a hash browns. However, before she had got over there, Jacob's mom had grabbed one of her cheapy throwaway forks and had slid it beneath her pancakes. And you are welcome. Anytime that is. Got it? Good. Great. And one thing is, mom had said that with meaning. Because she had meant what she said. She had meant that Kate could come over at any time. And that she didn't have to say anything else. Except just to appreciate what she had said. And one thing is... That wasn't a hard thing to do. It was just the idea of accepting it that was hard. And it was hard because not many people could accept that things are how they are for a reason. Instead, people had went against it. But not Kate. Kate was known as innocent and sweet by so many loving and caring adults like herself. But perhaps Jacob's mom had given her just a little more love, support, and care than most moms would to their own children. However, even though Kate had been in her early 20s, there had still been a connection between Jacob's mom and Kate. And by no means whatsoever did Kate and Jacob's mom fight about the sweetness in the mom's voice. It was meant to be that way because there was so much love and connection between the family and Jacob's friends. And one thing is, Jacob's parents had respected almost all of Jacob's friends, which to anyone was a normal thing. Only if you had asked the right person about it. When Jacob had finished his breakfast, excused himself from the table, cleaned his dishes, and gave his mom and dad a goodbye message, him and his friends had went out the door. Just when they did this, they had left Billy in charge of shutting the door. Then for a moment, there had been complete silence as the wind blew the leaves off of the sidewalk and into the grass. That wasn't until they had gotten no further than the neighbor's yard, and Josh had a response for Billy that went sort of like, You know, I think you have bad luck. You'll get used to it sooner or later. And Josh kicked a few pebbles and rock bits into the grass as he had walked beside Kate, who had been copying his every move. You don't suppose my bad luck is due to the custard dude, do you? After Billy had said that, he had paused in his tracks for only a few seconds as the other four, Kate, Josh, Jacob, and Bruno had stopped as well. Though the only reason why they had stopped was because of the, how shocked they were 
that Billy had the guts to mention the name of Custer right in front of them. However, that had led all four of them to the question of what just happened. And even though it had been quiet for quite some time, they didn't stare at him forever. Instead, during the time that it was quiet, the group had carried on with their long and hard walk to Creekford Park. And one thing is, they didn't even let out a single word for the rest of the trip, as they had enjoyed their walk. While taking in the situation of the beautiful weather and turning it into their wonderful respects for the qualities of nature and all of nature's fine characteristics, in spite of this, it wasn't the old cracky roads, rusty old worn out signs and cool painted candy colored buildings that they had brought their attention to. Instead, the attention had went to the thought of nature and all of the wonderful things about it rather than the odd junkie signs that had no literal means than to force the rules where they were needed at. And it also wasn't surprising that Bruno had chucked the ball over to Jacob so many times on their way there, as it was normal, it was a normal thing, and it wasn't necessary by any means of natural approval. When the group had finally arrived, Joss had checked his watch to try and see what time it was. Sadly, his watch had stopped working. How it had stopped working, he didn't know. But one thing is, he wasn't about to tell them that it didn't work. However, when Kate had asked a question, What's the matter, Jacob? That had led him to the worry of opening up and telling her and the group about it. But doing that was the hard part. And it hadn't been any of his concern until Kate had looked over his arm and saw that it did not work. And just when she had done that, she had said, Gee, no problem. All you had to do was say something. I could have helped you. This should be a simple fix. Joss looked up at her with a little bit of concern as he had removed his watch and gave it to her to try and fix. Well... Well, you try to fix that. I think me, Jacob, and Billy are going to go shoot some hoops. Jacob, what do you say, pal? Are you feeling for a few rounds with me? It was Bruno that had said those words, as he was just being curious about the matters and what his buddy Jacob had felt. Dude, I think I will pass for now. It's getting late, you know, and my mom might want me back by now. I know that I'm 26 years old. I just want to keep my mom happy. But hey, you and Josh and Kate go up. And Billy, you all make a wonderful couple. I'm sure Billy would love it. I'm just not feeling it today. So Jacob glanced over at Kate, who had finally figured out Josh's watch, simply by comparing it to the rate at which the sun was at and tracing it back to the old days with the use of the shadow clock. It was quite an ingenious idea, and it could give guidance to the ones who could not read or wind up a clock, but at least it had helped the group solve their issues of the matters. However, what was right for the rest of the group wasn't exactly right for Jacob, because his choice of words had put a huge impact on the relationship between him and his fellow friends, Bruno especially. And though Jacob's choice of words had affected not just him, at least he was listening to his mom and dad's commands, as they were more important than anything else in the world. And when Bruno had said his last words for the night, which were, that's fine, pal, I can't force you to do anything, Jacob had looked over at him and said, Thanks for your understanding. You are a true friend, and I like that about you. And after Jacob had said that, they had both given each other dude shakes, and then they had went off in their own separate ways. And though Jacob knew that the route back home would be long, he had decided to take the back road instead. To be honest, it was more like an alley than anything. But too many others like Jacob... It was just a shortcut, and it helped you get from one area to the next within a short time frame, and like anything to try and save time. You had to try to make your trips as short as possible, 
And that's what Jacob was trying to do. He was trying to get home quickly and safely, regardless of his age, to try and make his mom happy, which he had already known he could do. And one thing is, it wasn't that hard to make his mom happy. And his dad was the same way. His dad had hardly ever gotten mad at him. But when Jacob was just a young boy like he used to be, that had changed the matters dramatically. When it was five o'clock, the church bell had rang five consecutive times. And Jacob's mom had looked out the window while hoping that he was all right. Luckily for mom, when she came back to the window with the cup of coffee in her hands, Jacob had been crossing the street safely. That was when she had said, good job, my boy, good job, my boy. And with no further actions than to go into the kitchen, she took two small sips of her coffee and set it down at the table. And when Jacob had got into the house, they had prayed at the supper table. And then they ate supper, watched a little TV, and headed off to bed with no further plans for the night. Chapter 3 But it's mine. When Jacob had woken up the next morning, Boomer had been lying on his lap, chewing at a milk bone which had been glazed into his hand in a thick, sticky-like floppiness drench. However, that had all changed when Jacob had set up to turn his radio off, which had been talking about the latest news of Edison and Tesla. And after he had done that, Boomer had quickly jumped up off of the bed and had darted his way into Jacob's closet. Hey, what did you leave this sloppy thing on my bed? Come here right this instant, Boomer. You don't want me to get mom, do you? Jacob had said those words with a great meaning of respect and self-discipline to the level of a less pitiful attitude towards Boomer. It had been quiet for a split second as a small thud had pounded in the closet. I don't suppose, Jacob mumbled under his breath, now standing up at the spot of the moment to try to react to the situation. Just when he had done that, the thuds had gotten bigger. Bigger, 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 and one thing is, the more he had walked further ahead, the bigger the thuds had gotten, but that wasn't until he had figured that out. If he had taken a few steps back, it could help, so he had done just that. Boomer. Jacob tapped on the floor with his foot in a gentle way. Boomer, are you all right? You could tell that there was some panic in Jacob's voice as his voice had cracked and squealed after everything he said. Boomer, are you in there? That was Jacob, now standing as far away from the closet that he could possibly get. He sat down in the corner of the room, all hunched up with nothing to say or do. He sat, a creak came from the closet, as the door had opened just a hair more. I'm not afraid, Boomer. You can come out now. That was Jacob's smart and so-called lousy comeback. But one thing is, you could tell that Jacob was scared, as he was still crouched up in the corner of his room from the very moment that he had started sitting there, which had been just moments before. But that didn't matter any. All that mattered was that he was scared and that he wanted to save Boomer so badly, but he had been cooped up in the corner of his room, scared out of his mind, and though he didn't know what would happen next, it was fair to say that he had been worried, that he had been worried on not just one occasion, but on so many other occasions, and with that said, there had been a long and invisible line that had perhaps portrayed the goodness in Jacob's heart versus the badness that out of all had hurt Jacob's reputation in a more consequential and severe-like way. But perhaps the symbolism of Jacob sitting his life in a penitentiary or in some prison cell had defined the picture of the situation. And as it had complied with these matters in an, of course, or so-called obvious way, just as Jacob had resumed his quietness of not talking, Boomer had come out of his closet with a strange object that they had found on the night of Sheriff Patterson and his son Rex's death. 
while out and about, and even though Boomer had been all right, Jacob had still felt as if there was something wrong, something wrong with the object, something peculiar, and he had felt as if someone were behind the being of the object, not the creation, not the symbolism, not the meaning, the feeling that someone had set them up to try and gain revenge. But the question is, who was it? And what did they do? And what did they want from them? While having an urge to get a better perspective of the matters, Jacob had put his fear of the moments before off to the side and got up, went over to Boomer. While Boomer wasn't looking, Jacob had pulled the little strange handheld object from out of Boomer's mouth. Boomer had let go of it as he had jumped up on the bed to go and chew on his milk bone. Good job, Boomer. That's a good boy, Jacob had said, with a cross between sarcasm and excitement in his now soft but high-pitched voice, and with no further actions other than to do what he felt was right, he walked downstairs. But before he had done that, with what he felt was respect, he had placed a strange handheld object in his right hand, as he had done it so properly a time or two beforehand. Then when he had felt that it was the appropriate time to do so, and he was better prepared for some future outcomes, he had carried on and downstairs just as it was normal, and as he had done so often, usually on a day-to-day -day basis. Mom, Dad, Jacob had called out for them, now pacing all over the downstairs as he had looked like a complete insane and idiotic fool, just as he had done so. And after he had searched for quite some time, he had finally came upon the decision that it was time to check the basement, which he had really hated more than anything, and had hardly ever dared to go down into it. And since the house has been over two and a half centuries old, every now and then the house would do what you call a settlement. And one thing is, Jacob had really hated it because when the settlements had taken place, he had heard the voices of demons calling his name and dead cats scratching on the walls. Oftentimes, when he tried reporting it to his mom and dad, they had always made up the excuse that it was the Maxwells, which had been Jacob's old cousins from the mid-1600s. The thought of that even being a thing had scared him even more. But the fact that mom and dad had turned it into a man cave just a few years back, had made him feel way better about the matters. While taking a long and hard deep breath, Jacob had let out a sigh of relief as he had opened the basement door and had headed on downstairs. Luckily for him, the lights had been on, and so he carried on, while making his way down to the last three steps, all while seeing his mom and dad on the couch together. He had observed them while keeping an eye on their every move, and as he had done just that, he had noticed that both of them had a book of some sort in their hands and were reading them under their breath. But just when he had fixed his glasses and when Mom licked her finger to try and turn the page, Jacob had walked over to them with the object that he had rightfully claimed was his. However, just when he had done so, Mom had looked up at him as she had taken her attention off of the book and put it on him as he had held the object that he had been harboring with him since the day he and Boomer had first found it. And unfortunately, out of respect and non-hatredness to anyone or anything, Jacob had accepted that it was Boomer that had dug the object clean but it was him who had brought it home and did not confess about it from the very beginning. One thing is certain, due to Jacob's age and maturity levels, mom and dad had really ever punished him for such things. And though that's the way it had worked for Jacob, there were two, in fact, big reasonable things that had affected Jacob in a harsh way. And these two things, Jacob had probably accounted for at least a dozen times on a typical 
daily basis, but sadly for him, these two things were lying about matters and secretly going behind mom and dad's back. And just as it had been quiet, mom's observational skills set forth maximum between Jacob and herself. She had quickly snapped out of her quiet reading zone with that, and I had reacted to the matters of Jacob. Where did you get that? It's not yours. Put it back. And just as mom had said that, dad had reacted to the situation too. Though, for him, it was just a few moments after Jacob had started explaining himself. Boomer found it. I brought it home, I swear. Then dad had started reacting to the situation with a little bit of anger and frustration. One thing is, not even anger and frustration could define how mom and dad felt. In simple words, the object that Jacob had been harboring for the last few days was an evil stone that was called the Green Force Magic, as it was evil and could turn a single person into sugar if or when approached by it. However, with the thought of it even being in their house, that scared mom and dad to death. And now that this was imposed into the situations of their so-called wonderful and relaxing life, they had been rightfully angry with the fact of the matters. Now there was no use in even helping Jacob, as he had pushed his limits way too far this time around. Do you even know what this is? Dad asked while setting his book face down right beside him. No, and that was my question. What is it? Jacob said with a really wry sense of humor, as a way to mock Dad's self-expression and the use of words. That is dark magic, green force magic. It's really evil. That's why we have never told you about it when you were younger, and now that you are old enough and pretty mature, you can handle it. People and dogs are unworthy of it. They lose their control, and oftentimes... That person or animal isn't worthy enough. They melt into sugar. Sounds strange, Dad. That it is, son. That it is, son. But it is really evil. It can make you witness things and feel things that you haven't before. And with it, you can see things before it even happens. But when you get more used to it, it becomes more like a drug. Then with time, you turn into sugar. Custer? Yes, indeed. His name means constant. As soon as you can figure out what constant means, that's when you are safe from Custer. Now take that object back to where it belongs before it drains you empty. Dad had suggested those words in a charming way as he and Mom had went back to their reading and as Jacob had went back upstairs for a little bit longer before taking the object back to its original place. Then after he had done that, he had buried the object back into its rugged path of unknown and unfamiliar distinction. But until he was done, he was stuck out in the windy afternoon while listening to the birds sing and the moisture of the grass sizzle back into the surface where it had blown from the very beginning. And when he was back at the house, safe as he could be, he had fed Boomer with some of his dog bits. Then lastly, he had fixed himself some corned beef and cabbage, which had been a meal from the night before. Though before he had eaten, he had paid some huge respects to God and Jesus. And though it was so great and Jacob's will that he was the one praying to God and Jesus for forgiveness. It had run in Jacob's family that you pray before you eat. So it was that after Jacob had prayed, he had eaten the rest of his lunch, as they had done the same that night with a special dessert made rightly for them and two of Dad's best friends from high school, Tommy and Joe. And though the night had went on, and later there was a good night to Jacob from mom and dad, as he had wished them the same, and off to bed they went, with a fresh start to a new morning, great attitude that had yet to come.